Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome my two guests from North America. Welcome, Robert Clink. Hi, Arnie. Good to see you again. Please the last two Robert. mornings, I've woken up to snow on the ground. It's kind of discouraging. <laughs> <laughs> you're supposed warm to warm up in the next few days. You're supposed to be warming up. <laughs> I thought we were out of that. <laughs> you're supposed to be warming up. We're actually curling down a little bit here in Adelaide. There's been a drop. I think they call it a polar vortex or something. We lost about five or seven degrees. And, uh, mm. and you could feel it, the step change in temperature. And Mark Anderson, welcome, Mark. Great to be back, Arnie and, and Robert. It's been a little while. No worries. Pleased to have you. How's the weather in uh, Texas, if you're in Texas? Yeah, I am. Oh, Fahrenheit today was about 80, maybe 78, a little bit humid. I was just at the ocean at South Padre Island, very beautiful place on the Gulf there. Okay. Spent a wedding anniversary there just the other day. So. Oh, beautiful. Well, congratulations on your anniversary. That's yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. It's always good to Thanks. celebrate. Yeah, no worries. Beautiful. All right. I'm going to open the um, uh, our newspapers for the day and see what uh, see what's so glaring out there. So the Australian, um, talking a little bit about vaccines, but I also see that there is now a step change in the media in regard to climate, climate, climate threat, carbon threat, decarbonising the world. And in conjunction with, of course, the COVID infected ship, that's COVID vaccine reset. And of course, the angry young lady, Greta. All right. Well, I, I don't give her much time, so uh, leave her out of it. Um, and of course, the missing submarine in, in uh, Malaysia, which is tragic. So, OK, we're looking at climate. We're looking at uh, COVID and um, politics in the money side of things. Um not too much, I think. The uh, as far as money goes, money in a sense, the markets they're they're reasonably stable. I don't think there's anything glaring except that I have been receiving information about digital currency and an increased focus on digital currency. Um, the Epoch Times. Um, I think there's nothing in particular about the Epoch Times that I think is demanding. What I did find, though was interesting because we're celebrating uh, Anzac Day on Sunday in two days' time. Anzac Day, of course, is the uh, the failed campaign at Gallipoli where the Australian, New Zealand, the British and other allies invaded uh, Gallipoli Cove and to the tune of some, I think it was some 45,000 fatalities on the Allies' side, 65,000 fatalities on the Turk Arabian side. So 110,000 people died in that stalemate. Now, we celebrate that, but at the same time, we're receiving significant feedback from, if, if you like, cultural Marxists against our veterans, against war, against Anzacs. And of course, there's been a lot of promotion about domestic violence. And I wanted to actually look at these things because I think there seems to be a theme in it. And René Girard, this is a book depository. These are some of his books. I'm actually reading Violence and the Sacred at the moment. And I believe that René Girard has touched on these things in his research. He's now passed, but his research covers this bloodlust, if you like, this bloodlust to actually blame someone. And in this case, the veterans... Um, or the, if you like, the, the male or the white male or the white Christian male, um, that sort of thing, to blame them for all the wrongs and therefore let's destroy them. Now, I was listening to a UK column uh, broadcast the other day, it may have even been yesterday, and in it, the child support agency in Britain is actually attributed to cause 1,000 suicides a year through their pursuit of of illegal, illegal child support claims. And uh, and the thing is that this is going through Britain, it's going through the um, politicians and campaigns for them to actually address the um, malevolence of that particular department. And I've, I've had first-hand experience in this, and I know how hard it is. And at one stage, at one stage, I did the math, and I considered I was being taxed or garnished 87 cents, 87 cents for every dollar that I earned. 
and that to me was particularly brutal but I found a place in space and time that I could deal with it and process it and I was considered myself a slave to these departments for the uh, for the 18 years that I was uh, involved in that. So be it, that was life, it hardens you up, you get on with it. But a thousand people, a thousand people were not getting on with it. They actually chose to um, suicide rather than persevere with that sort of brutality towards them. Government benevolence or bureaucratic benevolence. And it's really hard to comprehend this bloodlust, this bloodlust that comes from self-righteous government departments um, against individuals who they wouldn't know from a bar of soap and yet they seem to be attributed with collective blame. I, I can't understand it, um, but others may. Anyway, that's my opening thoughts for today and I'll give uh, Robert Clink the floor to give me yours. Robert. Well, I I listened to that same statistic about a thousand and I, I when I heard it, I had the impression it was actually a thousand servicemen who had committed suicide. I might be wrong about that, but uh, I certainly agree that the attitude of bureaucracies, now not all the individuals in the bureaucracies, many of them are decent people, but they are uh, subservient to this attitude of superiority. And I think that any illusion people had that we had something, uh, according to the American formula of government by the people, should have been shattered by now. Because it's obvious that we are governed over. And as individuals in society, we have absolutely no influence on policy whatsoever. And the, sh the shift in this direction has come so dramatically with the uh, COVID crisis, uh, uh, governments are acting com without any consultation of population, without any consultation even of rivals in the political field, and uh, imposing measures that were inconceivable, <laughs> you know, 15 months ago. Who, who could have imagined that they would be preventing people from expressing their opinions, preventing people from moving around freely, preventing people from uh, uh, all sorts of things. I mean, we, we've got a, a, a government here. Uh, I'm not in Ontario. I'm right adjacent to the province, but I can't go into Ontario anymore. I guess the people of Australia got familiar with this concept when uh, the state of Victoria was sort of isolated. But this is something new in Canada. We cannot uh, cross a provincial border. Uh, we can, but we will be stopped by the police and they will ask us to justify the fact that we are crossing that border. You know, something unimaginable before. But we have uh, entered uh, a new uh, concept of the relationship between the population and its uh, governing class. And as far as I can see, the relationship is absolute arbitrary power on the part of the people ostensibly in power. Now, I don't think these politicians are deciding any of these, these policies. I don't think even that the uh, health officials the, in the various jurisdiction are deciding them. The orders are coming from elsewhere, but it's all top down and absolutely no influence from the bottom whatsoever. There was a time when you thought you could contact your member of parliament and possibly influence policy, but we're in a different era. And unless we do something about this, this is going to be a state of affairs that is going to last for a very long time and possibly forever. It's the total uh, conversion of our society into a, uh, a planned uh, state in which individuals have no, uh, no power to influence government policy. A very, a very new concept in uh, countries that were assumed to be democratic and in some way controllable by the people 
who are resident in them, who are citizens in them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Robert. It's uh, it's interesting you, you say that. You're more or less painting the picture that we elect a dictatorship. And uh, and in actual fact, there are two books in our in our library. I think uh, um, one is the Passing of Parliament. Um, there's another book. I'll remember it, and I'll get it back to you later. But the Passing of Parliament, essentially, the um, where it was Parliament handed over authority to administer the law through to the bureaucracy, the Passing of Parliament, and and of course we've got the um, the party machine itself. There's uh, the Chesterton Belloc book there there's probably three of them it talks about where we actually transitioned across to these um, to these totalitarian arrangements and of course when it goes from the parliament to the party which it has and then from the party room it's gone to the bureaucracy and now we've gone from the bureaucracy to the if you like the international bureaucracy so it's a complete deconstruction of our ancient rights and freedoms. Your thoughts, please, uh, Mark Anderson. Yeah, um, I appreciate this topic, guys. Um, I was just reading a book of, or booklet on the ALOR website just today and yesterday, and it is The Essential Christian Heritage by Eric Butler. And it talks, if, if I may describe it in sweeping terms, it talks about common law versus this phrase we hear all the time, the rule of law. And we hear that in the United States a lot. We abide by the rule of law, not the rule of men. Well, the rule of law has become the rule of men. And so there's been this strange juxtaposition of things. Um, I once heard a Constitution Party presidential candidate in 2016 Darrell Castle say something very important, however, about that phrase, the rule of law, because people often say, as he described it, no one is above the law. But then he added a caveat that you don't usually hear. He said, no one is above the law, but no one is beneath its protection. That is, that is a really important addition to that, in my opinion, because that's kind of what we're seeing. It, we're seeing the rule of law that's been conflated into meaning whoever has the guns and badges rules. The golden rule is now whoever has the gold rules instead of the golden rule uh, that Christ talked about on the Sermon on the Mount. Everything's been perverted and twisted and flipped on its head. So if we were to add that caveat, no one is beneath its protection, then that would mean that any citizen, no matter what their lot in life, would be afforded an equal share of the protection of the law. But if you take that caveat out, that part, no one is beneath his protection, and you just go with this rule of law thing, that has come to mean something far different than people even assume it means. So they hear the rule of law and they feel proud of their country. You know, we, we're run by the rule of law, but now it's, as Butler notes in this booklet, the essential Christian heritage. Now it's people believe that you elect a government and once you've voted, assuming the election is even honest and assuming the vote count is even accurate, once you've voted, you just let your MP or your congressman just, uh, you know, basically have the moon, the universe, the stars and the sun. You, there, in other words, there's no limit to their authority once you elect them. They can pass any law they want, no matter how arbitrary. And, and people actually believe that's normal, that that you can just let them take power that you delegated to them or entrusted them with with your vote and just take the ball and run with it. But in the essential Christian heritage, Butler makes it clear that that is not and cannot be true, that if we have God-given rights, um, that means that we're supposed to have a universal uh, idea of what is moral, the, the natural law, as it's often called. I'm hearing a lot of line noise right now. Yeah, keep going. Um, yeah, so the this this idea that... that uh, power is limitless once we elect people is supposed to be countermanded by the idea of the will of God and that 
divine law or natural law first has to be satisfied. And then you only establish government subservient to that divine law and natural law. And then you add another layer to that and you say, okay, divine and natural law, government has to be subservient to that, but we need, we need something clear cut for civics purposes, for daily government, for the structure of government. So that's where constitutions come in. But constitutions kind of recognize, at least a good constitution recognizes natural law and divine law. Therefore, it limits the power of government. It, it uh, shares power among different branches of government. It denies the central government certain powers and reserves them to the states or the people, which is the U.S. Tenth Amendment. See, so this, this meanness, this bloodlust, this arbitrary power we're seeing is just a complete uh, signal or uh, indication that people have not been taught or have forgotten about or have been, in fact, even taught the opposite of the idea of divine law, natural law, constitutional law. And so they, they believe their, their elected rulers should have really no essential limits on their powers. And not being very cognizant of what's going on, I think what happens is the people just reach a stress point, a tipping point, because they either they know something's wrong or they, or they and they can't do anything about it, or they don't realize what is wrong. They just kind of sense that something's off kilter and they have no recourse but to blame one another and attack one another. Because as you guys said, try and contact a member of parliament or a state governor or any of them now. I mean, I can get a small response out of a Michigan state representative if I'm lucky, but pretty much anything other than that, I, I wrote the Texas governor about some very crucial COVID matters I didn't even get a reply in the in the form of a form letter, not even a thank you for writing, just absolute total silence. And that didn't used to be the case. And I think that people don't want to admit, but they sense that they have been completely disenfranchised. So they lash out at one another. That That's my educated take on things. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Mark. And I think that's, uh, that's vitally important to to take it into account as to what we're actually seeing with our government and what we're seeing with our representatives from all levels, all tiers of government, because I'm experiencing the same. I, I must admit I haven't pursued the matter any further, but I've been trying for a long time to see my state rep and uh, I haven't pursued it, so okay, maybe he's forgotten. But I certainly had it left with him and his, I call him his minder, uh, left it with his minder that I wanted to speak to him. I wanted to talk to him about the lockdown and everything else. Now, I'll just cut across to our website. Under the Social Credit Library, you'll find Social Credit Library on the right. Here is Eric Butler, and the Essential Christian Heritage is right there. And uh, scan uh, interestingly enough, that was actually scanned in just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've done the right thing and, and continued to keep those um, those booklets. As we're working them through, I keep them on the boil and um, and place them in an, under a PDF. Uh, your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, the essential <clears throat> Christian heritage is based on the principle that every individual is responsible to his creator. Ultimately, he's not responsible to his government uh, in a primary sense, He's responsible to his creator. And this is where the conflict between the Christian and the modern state uh, comes into play. Because the modern state makes a uh, totalitarian claim on the uh, responsibility of the individual. But Christians don't see their position in the universe in that way. And this is why I think Christians in this new order are going to be detested so much because we just will not fit in. If we're going to retain our faith, then we have to maintain our relationship, our personal relationship with God. And this is a relationship that you have for your life. It evolves. It develops. You uh, acquire new understandings and uh, and therefore your your 
thinking changes, but we're in a, a situation politically where everything is supposed to be static and the individual is uh, not regarded as uh, a, a, a being that is tracing a path through life and coming to new understandings as he does that. I'm sure that uh, uh, you've had this experience. I certainly have some, some uh, things that come to you almost as revelations. They're transformative. And uh, the state doesn't care about that one bit. But Christians do. Christians believe that our responsibility is to, is to our God. Now, uh, as far as the political situation goes, I think that uh, for you know, a very long time now, it's more than a century, there has been an attempt to alienate people from influence uh, over their government. And uh, this has been implemented largely through, in uh, uh, Commonwealth countries at least, what are called regulations and statutory instruments. And every parliament is generating these things by the hundreds every time, uh, every session of parliament. Uh, they, they get together and I was working in the House of Commons back in the, oh, the early 80s, I guess. And in Canada, we had over 16,000 of these subordinate laws. It gets to the point where government assumes its role is just to generate, to proliferate these laws so that in, a, in, a, in effect, and in some way, everybody is in contravention of law. And when they've got you in that position, they've got a tremendous hold over you. So this, is, this has been going on for a long time. And now I think we've actually gone to a, another stage in this process of alienating people from uh, any semblance of control over their government because we're living in a period where we are dictated to on the basis of all sorts of projections, mathematical uh, uh, concepts of, of what's going to be happening in the future with this, with this COVID sickness. The projections have proven to be complete nonsense in a, generally speaking, but nevertheless, the governments are imposing controls on people on the basis of uh, what a few uh, modelers in universities are telling them is the likelihood of the evolution of COVID. Well, this is completely uh, emasculating the population on the basis of some individuals' imaginings. And uh, the individuals who've been particularly influential, this uh, uh, Niall Ferguson or Neil Ferguson, I guess, uh, in Britain, he has a dreadful uh, uh, past in uh, estimating the deleterious effects or the harmful effects of, of disease on populations. And yet he's the one they've turned to and I think he has also been used by Canada and the United States. He's the world authority on these things. They get one person and he does his projections. And on the basis of those, the whole of society is uh, constrained and uh, dictated to and robbed of its, its traditional freedoms. So... Uh, it's uh, uh, just a, a continuous process of alienating people from the potential to have any influence over those who are purportedly governing them. Mm. Thank you for that, Robert. Really important points you've touched on there. And again, I'm going to cut across to websites. Uh, I had a, this email sent to me with a link about a UK politician who's within the opposition. Within the opposition... Uh, he was thrown out of a pub because the um, because the publican was disgusted in his behaviour, in the fact that he was supporting the lockdown 
and the fact that the average age of death from COVID is higher than the average age of general death anyway, and that there was no excessive numbers of um, mortality for that year in comparison to historical numbers. And, and the thing is that these politicians are being called to order, but they appear to be running or working from the same, the same sheet, the same program. And it doesn't matter whether they're in opposition or in government, they appear to be working together in cahoots. Very, very important to recognise that, that this is a bipartisan policy. This is a bipartisan pursuit. And I believe it was the, the in the end, the end intent of political parties in the first place. The end intent of political parties was to subvert the parliament so that it was not a representative institution. Your thoughts, please, uh, Mark Anderson. Yeah, again, good discussion topic, guys. I'm looking at Butler's book here, which I read most of this morning, and he notes here, and I'll pick, a, pick and choose a little here, cherry pick, every civilization is the incarnation of underlying values. The British historian Charles, or excuse me, Christopher Dawson, a devout Christian, observed that all great civilizations have admitted the existence of a higher law above that of the tribe and nation and so on, and consequently have subordinated national interest and political power to those higher spiritual values, which are derived from this source. On this point, there is a consensus of principle which unites all the world religions and all the great civilizations of the past, quote, end quote, by the British historian Christopher Dawson. And he, uh, Butler goes on to write, Western civilization has been correctly described as a Christian civilization. It is true that civilization owes to the legacy of Greece and Rome as well. Uh, the Greek philosophers struggle with the problem of how to make individual liberty a reality. While the Romans provided man with a firm concept of the rule of law, there's that rule of law, but it was the Christian teaching that man is a special creature made in God's image which have the human person a significance unknown outside of Western Europe. Now, mankind saw himself as part of a type of cosmic spiritual drama and felt like he had the power to shape history. Unlike the religions of the East and so on and so forth, Christianity was a religion of hope. It encouraged the development of man's creative spirit and so on and so forth. And it goes on in Butler's book to talk about the Magna Carta and he talks about a, another um, writer, or uh, excuse me, uh, Archbishop Langton, L-A-N-G-T-O-N. And as the famous English historian Sir Arthur Bryant wrote in the history of England, and Butler is relating this, it was not Langston's wish to see the crown overthrown, the law ignored, the realm divided, the barons petty tyrants, what he wanted was that the king should preserve the law his predecessors created. And now you can you can look at that as, you know, preserving the law your predecessors created. That would mean that Americans should try to preserve the spirit, if not the letter, of the American founders, like Jefferson and Madison. And Canada would look to its roots. And Australia would look to its roots. That's why tradition is so important, as Douglas talked about, you can't have a society where you stop learning from the past, from one generation to the next. You got to have that that transgenerational learning, and that learning would consist of learning civics. It would it would consist of learning our relationship to our governors. But above all, we would learn that we and our political governors are both subject to the divine will, to the natural law that is above all nations and came in the form of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in the New Testament. Now, this is my own thoughts here. But basically, as Sir Arthur Bryant went on to write in his History of England, and it was to the law that the archbishop appealed, not only of man, but of God, for it was the essence of medieval philosophy that God ruled the earth, and that man and kings and, and bureaucrats and MPs and congressmen, I'm adding a little here, must further God's ends by doing justice. So the purpose of government is, suppo is supposed to be furthering the ends of God. And then the governed 
and the governors, the rulers and the ruled would all be subject to the divine will, the natural law. So you can see, guys, why the all oh, the American Civil Liberties Union, the secular humanist movement, uh, the Zionist movement to an extent, um, many movements under many guises, Marxism and so on, has sought to create this phony separation of church and state. They had to, they had to get mankind in a position where we no longer could perceive that divine will to appeal to. There would no longer be that divine or natural law where governments and the people would both have to be subordinate. So they came up with this separation of church and state. Oh, you can't have the Ten Commandments in a public park. Oh, you can't have a nativity scene in the library's lawn or something. All of that was phony. What they're really trying to do is get rid of the idea that man and his governments are both subject to a God, a God that really exists. And so they wanted to get godly ideas out of the public square to do that, they came up with this phony idea. Well, we won't want, we don't want the Ten Commandments on public land. All of that was a ruse so they could get Christian ideas out of our politics, out of our organic affairs, and they have largely succeeded. Where the church still stands, it's confused about its own role. Um, they really don't know. They they always talk about in Christianity. Well, we, we must shun the flesh. We must we must. Um, forego temptations of the flesh. Now, there's some truth to that, of course. And then they get so otherworldly that they're they're of no earthly good. Uh, what it says in Butler's writings, and I've seen it elsewhere, is it's it's supposed to be the word, the word of God made flesh, made organic, made incarnate in our daily affairs. So all people, including our rulers, would understand that they have a higher law to obey and. Without that higher law to obey, it's clear that they're willing to do any regulation, vote for any kind of legislation. It doesn't matter how despotic it is um, to achieve absolute power. And their divine law is the bankers. If there's a power above politics, it's banking and not not the God in heaven that created uh, heaven, that created the earth and created everything on it, all the flora and fauna and man, his crowning achievement, humankind. So there's been this march through the institutions to get rid of every last vestige of that relationship to God that made the rulers behave. And now we're seeing the bitter fruits of it. And the last thing I'll mention is uh, the well-known Catholic um, Bishop Fulton Sheen, or was he an archbishop? I forget. He made an interesting point and that is that if things are not working and we're really hitting the wall, that in an ironic way, that's proving the validity of God's will and God's word. Because when you contradict God's word, look what happens. Yeah. So in a negative rather than a positive way, the hardships, I mean, uh, Bob Clank here, not even, not, even, not even able to lawfully or legally drive from one province to another. That's total insanity. But this... This uh, petty dictatorship, this despotism, this extreme stress they're putting people through, all the suicides you guys mentioned, it's we when we try to live without God, when we try to live without that divine or natural law, we see what happens. And that's what Fulton Sheen was talking about. The problems are proof that God's law is real, because when you contravene them, this is the negative side, the flip side of it. And look at what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, exactly right. I might just add, just to um, substantiate uh, Butler's book, you mentioned Steve, Stephen Langton, Archbishop. Of course, he was the he was the principal guidance behind the uh, Magna Carta and compelling John to put his seal on uh, King John Magna Carta for twelve fifteen. So uh, very important. Right. And of course, the you look at the church as as individuals within the church, not necessarily an orchestrated orchestrated structure. But the individuals within church can hold on to a truth and, if you like, challenge with authority against evil. Because under Henry VIII, there was not only the um, the archbishop, I think, who was um, who was beheaded, but it was also another cardinal. Um, there were two who refused to accept that the king should have the crown of kingship and the crown of the church. 
and that was the resistance against Henry VIII. And of course, he he pursued both, and now we're looking at both those crowns as sitting in Parliament and shifting from Parliament to the party and from the party into the bureaucracy, and and of course, moving out of now the bureaucracy into the hallways of the United Nations of those public private partnerships, non representational completely autocratic or technocratic. And that's what we're seeing is that outworking. We're seeing the deconstruction and the opportunity of the individual to consider their soul. It's not just the people in the public. It's also the evil that the bureaucrats and the administrators and the bankers and the politicians, their soul is important. And the Lord's Prayer talks about lead us not into temptation, They've yielded to this temptation. They are serving mammon rather than serving God. And this temptation needs to be actually taken away from them. They shouldn't have that much power. And that's the idea of a limited constitution, a limiting constitution, clearly defined powers not to move any further. Your thoughts, please, um, Robert Clink. Well, <clears throat> we were told that all things were made new in Christ. And I agree with you, Arnie, that I think even these evildoers are ultimately supposed to be <laughs> made new. <laughs> I hope they can make it because <laughs> they're certainly not uh, on the right path at present. Uh, the thing is that <clears throat> Christianity holds that man is essentially a spiritual being. He has a body, but his body is subordinate to his spirit. The body is just a sort of residence or house for the spirit. And what's motivating modern politics is materialism. It's derived largely from uh, the concept of Darwinian evolution. You know, we just got here by some processes through the material world. And our value is no greater than the material of which we're made, I guess. And then <clears throat> we get into the people who are agitating now, uh, largely financed and encouraged by financial powers and corporate powers. People don't think of this. They think that there's an, uh, an antagonism between large financial interests, corporate interests, and uh, revolutionary from the revolution from the, the base of society. But these two have cooperated from the beginning. The financiers want to consolidate their power and they use these revolutionaries to uh, as tools in, in that process because the revolutionaries want to take the power away from uh, individuals in society. So it's very important for people to grasp that concept. It's a novel for most, I'm sure, but they have to see the financial and large corporate powers as being in alignment with the objectives of these uh, people who are tearing things apart in the street. They are allies, not enemies. Um, so we've entered a phase of materialism uh, you know, for generations now. Young people have not been given a, a higher vision of the nature of man. And the uh, Marxists who are materialists, but they're dialectical materialists, have stepped onto the stage and are exerting a tremendous influence. Well, what is dialectics? Dialectics is opposition, dialectics, it's conflict, it's violence. And the whole thinking processes of the people who are uh, pushing for the remaking of society now is based on this concept of conflict. You know, the races are in conflict, the sexes are in conflict, political parties are in conflict, although not very much anymore. <laughs> if you've got conflict in politics, you've got an opposition in general, the opposition is demanding uh, uh, more severe anti-human policies 
than the government itself. When the opposition expresses itself, it's usually to tell the government they're not doing enough in the way of suppressing individual freedoms. It's a, a, a total uh, abandonment of the traditional concept of, of the opposition in our political systems. Uh, anyway, we've got this uh, party system, as you were mentioning, Arnie. It is just a snare. It's a trap because it sets people in opposition to each other, but it also robs them of the notion that as citizens, they have an ongoing uh, influence on governmental policy. The only thing, the only way you can exert influence under the theory of the party is that if you're not happy with things, you have to get rid of the people who are in power and put another batch in. Well, this has been done over and over and people still seem to fall for it, although less because this Trump phenomenon was obviously a rejection of the conventional uh, view of, of politics. He was a, 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 a an iconoclast, they thought, in the political system in, in the United States. I don't think he turned out to be such an iconoclast. As I understand it, yesterday or today, he has said that uh, people who are uh, against uh, the vaccination program uh, in the battle against COVID are uh, wrong-headed and uh, primitive in their thinking. Everybody should be going for these vaccines. Well, that is something that every individual should be able to decide for himself, and we shouldn't be subjected to inordinate pressure from politicians in order to do it. But I see now in Canada, there, we've got a betrayal of the uh, conservative-oriented people. We've got a new leader in the, uh, of the Conservative Party. He's almost as bad as Justin Trudeau. It'd be hard to be worse than Justin Trudeau, but he's thinking in the same lines completely. So the people who hoped that a political party would uh, give them an opportunity to alter policy are feeling that this this uh, this hope is is lost, and so they're looking to start a new party. Well, <laughs> there's got to be a better way. They'll start a new party. It will not uh, have any political success in the next election or the probably the election after that. And by the time it does have success, it will have been infiltrated and taken over, and will be presenting would be following the program of internationalism in exactly the same way as the liberal and conservative and NDP in Canada parties are now. So the party system, the whole concept of it must be challenged. And there has to be found a, a way for people to exert their influence on politics uh, at any time when their uh, dissatisfaction with the way they're being governed attains a certain uh, a certain point that they absolutely want to alter it. I, I know that uh, there are mechanisms for this. The, the recall one is one. I'm not sure that is uh, going to prove conclusive, but it certainly can uh, uh, put a little bit of discomfort in the politicians who feel that they might not be uh, assured of, of keeping their uh, their uh, governing uh, position, but these these politicians, if they betray, if they if they obey the international uh, powers, if they perform their functions well, and basically their functions are just functions of acting, as far as I can see, they're just actors. They're not the originators of policy. They're just PR people for policies that are coming from from outside. And uh, uh, there has to be a way to bring them to heel. It's absolutely essential. Now, Mark was mentioning finance. The key to this absolutely is for the population to regain control, regain or at least perhaps acquire for the first time control over the uh, money system because it's the money system that is constantly 
uh, centralizing power and uh, uh, financing uh, subversive policies. And until we get control over that, we're absolutely subject at any time to having uh, our, our, uh, our, our freedoms taken away. Uh, there is, I mean, it's, it's an odd thing that people accept that some organization can produce the money that the society needs in order to function economically and uh, inject this into the community arbitrarily favoring some and suppressing others. This is such a completely anti-democratic concept that anybody who understands what's going on has to, has to reject it. And we need a policy of democratizing the money system. And democratizing means decentralizing. And every citizen of the country should have a stake in the in the money system and should have the right to participate in the benefits of the issuing of of the money this is a concept that was developed in social credit and without it really we're just uh, spinning our wheels and losing ground so this is this is the key to the whole uh, salvation of our situation but uh Unfortunately, we've got a long way to go to uh, bring a realization of this to the population. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Robert. I'm going to um, cut across to uh, another website. This is actually the ALOR archives. And in particular, I wanted to show you two statements. One is by H.G. Wells, uh, 1920. In the English Sunday Express, he says, Big business is by no means antipathetic to communism. The larger big business grows, the more it approximates to collectivism. It is the upper road of the few instead of the lower road of the masses to collectivism. And another statement in that same issue, so this is to do with Prince Philip, that was his passing, uh, a special issue for him. And this is uh, Lenin. He says, that there were people who were ber he berated those of his colleagues who criticised large corporations, saying that their formation and growth are to be encouraged as essential to the historic amalgamating development of the ultimate communist Marxist world state. So you've got Lenin and you've got H.G. Wells saying the same thing, that um, big business the bigger it is, the more it approximates to collectivism. So we're seeing that, that as these, if you like, these assets of the entire world are falling into the hands of these giant mega corporations, giant international central banks, and as all these assets are falling in, that the collectivism is the exact model that they are pursuing. The upper road of the few to the lower road of the many. Your thoughts, please, and I guess we could call for um, closing comments. Mark Anderson. Yeah, well put, Arnie. Uh, absolutely. The politicians are like chess men on the chessboard for the banksters. And their usurious rule, of course, goes back a very long time, millennia, really. And that's why it's so hard to dislodge, as Bob was indicating, Certainly, to begin to confront this monster, a couple things come immediately to mind from my own experience, and that it's very important that we're doing what we're doing now, what I do with my alternative media, what we're doing with this show, and the many, many other shows that are getting increasingly closer to the truth and to empowering people. UK Column comes to mind, many others. And... The information war, the battle for the narrative, is the, is the thing that's tangible for us right now. We can't really quite get our grasp on the money system or realign it or create it the way we want it to be, as Bob indicated. First, we've got to get the narrative. We've got to get our message out and begin to contradict and countermand and refute the dominant narrative, which comes from the powers that be 
who think they're God and who have denied the real God, denied natural law, de de denied divine law, and put in their arbitrary rule in its place. Another thing that's an element of what we can do right now besides the battle for the narrative, which I think is within our grasp, but we have to be very persistent. The other thing is good old fashioned civil disobedience. In other words, bald faced rebellion. Um, maybe I'm sounding cocky, but if I lived in Canada, I would drive from one province to another and intentionally get arrested and get my day in court. Um, they need to hear the refuting of their arbitrary laws. They need to have them challenged in every possible way. Uh, it mentions in Butler's book here, uh, it mentions a Professor Harold Lasky, a, a Marxist, stressing that the, uh, the idea of Christianity being an essential part of the British constitution must be rejected in favor of the concept of the sovereignty of parliament. And that's kind of what we're seeing too, the sovereignty of parliament or the sovereignty of the US Congress, as opposed to the sovereignty of the individual and the individual and the government both being under the divine or natural law. And uh, as Butler wrote, and I'll summarize, the lawyers and judiciary are expected to spend their time in interpreting the stream of laws, in other words, regulations passed by governments without any reference to natural or Christian law. Added to this is the framing of regulations which have the force of law by non-elected officials, that's the bureaucracy, using delegated power. And uh, so on and so forth. Uh, Professor G. Keaton, 30 years down the road, um, said in a book called The Passing of Parliament, and where's it at? It says here, um, it mentions that once upon a time, I'm talking about the Magna Carta, the Great Charter is directed to be allowed as the common law. This was uh, back at the time of the Magna Carta. All judgments contrary to it are declared void. And get this, copies of the Magna Carta were ordered to be sent to all cathedral churches and read twice a year to the people. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it there the so-called medieval times, the so-called darker times, were in fact in some ways more enlightened despite the relative lack of technology. Although I, I sometimes think the high technology we have now has been rediscovered and actually has existed longer in various forms than we realized, but that's a conversation for another time. But certainly there used to be a time when broad fundamental uh, relationships of man to the government, of man to God, of fundamental principles like the reading of the Magna Carta. These used to be common things, but you don't see the Bill of Rights being read on the United States television anymore or anything comparable in Canada. Um, people are being, entire generations are being raised without even having an inkling, guys, of any of the concepts we're discussing today, not even an inkling. They go through life, it's just six packs and sports and go to the casino, lose your shirt, get up the next day, go to work, go to sleep, get up the next day, go to work, eat, go to sleep, repeat, 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 and that's their life. These, these principles have been squeezed out. It's our job to put them back in and it really comes down to the narrative and that's where, and I know it's tough, but that's where we at least have a fighting chance. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. No worries. I really appreciate um, your input, Mark. And I'm just going to give a couple of links because I've managed to uh, find them across on the websites. So there's two of them that I've found. This is Keaton. Um, and so this is the passing of Parliament, uh, which is very important. That's on our website. And as is this uh, by Belloc and Chesterton, which is the party system. Um, so we've got both those books there, and I'm going to see if I can find that third book, which is Bureaucratic Law Lawlessness. I'm not sure who the actual um, author is, but I'll keep looking for it. Uh, your thoughts and closing comments, please, Robert. Yes, well, uh, we have this uh, problem of dialectics that I've mentioned. Uh, these are all things that people are ignorant of. 
the population has no concept that there is a trained group of individuals who are functioning on the basis of uh, an advanced concept of man and human psychology and everything else. And these people are have penetrated society in all areas, unfortunately, and they are uh, dialecticians. Uh, th this is a, 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 a something that should be a basic matter of education in the educational system. But as Mark says, the educational system is vapid. It's without content, and it is completely divorced from the founding principles of our, our, our society. So there is a, a, a responsibility on the part of government to inform the population of the, the basis on which the society operates. And this has been neglected and even subverted in every Western society now for, for decades. It's very interesting that when the social credit government was elected in Alberta, they set up study groups throughout the province because they wanted the population to be informed about current events and about the financial system and about any uh, system that impinged on their lives. And in fact, it's uh, the premier at that time, William Aberhart, who had been a high school principal I think he was just sort of a pure heart. He didn't really have a place in politics. But uh, he said at one point that he regretted that they had started a political party. He said he thought that the way to go was to educate young people and uh, they would go out into society and they would re regenerate uh, the society on the basis of sound principles. Uh, this is a... Uh, obviously a big goal and we haven't taken any steps toward it but if we could just get a, a, a number of individuals young people to be uh, aware of uh, what has been stolen from them and to be, become advocates for a, uh, a rejuvenation of the society they live in things can change in a big hurry there was a, uh, a uh, pastor in Edmonton. He, uh, on, on Easter Sunday, the police came and tried to shut down his service. And he just drove them out of the church. And they slunk away with their tails behind their legs. It was astonishing. These people always travel in packs. You don't have an individual policeman come to your door and discuss things anymore. You have six of them with all sorts of heavy armament come to your door and try to intimidate you. And when the six are there, they are not functioning as individuals with consciences. They are lost in a group psychology and they surrender their autonomy to the group. So this is another thing that is being used against us. But this, this pastor who drove them out, uh, the event was recorded by some of his parishioners and he just said, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking. Get out, get out, get out. And they, they, uh, they left in a, a very uh, lame fashion. And apparently that video has been shown more than one billion times on the Internet. Can you imagine that? What an example was set for mankind by one pastor, an unknown pastor in, in Edmonton, Alberta, and his example has gone around the world of how you can confront evil. And by the force of your personality and the purity of your spirit, you can drive it away. Okay. Thank you for that, Robert. I'm going to just do a summary of some documents. And uh, if you're interested, Mark, I'll, I'll give you the floor once more. Um, our website. Now, just to reinforce, our website is an educational website. And we promote study and we promote doing your own research and that's why we've actually got all these libraries up here now our videos are produced every week as are the podcast and from the podcast and video we produce the on target but just below the on target you'll find the first course 
the first training session, which is the Social Dynamics course, of which there are three videos and three podcasts, if you like, and there's also the Essential Christian Heritage, Social Dynamics and Releasing Reality, all three booklets by Eric Butler and also the podcasts that accompany the three videos. Just to reinforce that point, and also a couple of um, other books within our library. We mentioned today Gustave Le Bon and the Crowd, this bloodlust that's there and how we can get caught up in it, and the New Despotism. That was the other book I was looking for, which essentially is about bureaucratic lawlessness by Lord Hewitt of Berry. And then, of course, Keaton is there, The Passing of Parliament, and The Party System by Belloc and Chesterton. So, uh, Mark Anderson, I can see you chafing at the bit. I'm happy to give you the floor once more. Well, I won't add a whole lot more. Uh, I like Bob using the example of the Edmonton Church. That's what I meant by civil disobedience and bald-faced rebellion. Uh, in my own language, I call it loosening the screws. The first thing you do when you're completely backed into a corner is you've got to you've got to make an escape of that corner that you're, you've been backed into. You've got to push back that initial pushback. It's not a violent thing, but it's a very assertive thing. And the, this pastor provides a great example. Sometimes you just have to say no. The word no can be a powerful thing if you act on it uh, logically and with reasonable restraint, but also with sufficient force. You find the balance point. And that has to happen lots of times. If it really did get a billion hits, uh, let's see more of that kind of rebellion, that kind of assertiveness from more pastors in the States, in Canada, in Australia, in Europe. We need to see that emulated. And I would think that with it getting that many views, it would be copied. Um, you know, the surest form of flattery is to imitate. So hopefully that'll happen along with the alternative media work that we all try to do in our own different ways. And I've been working hard with Stop the Presses, my news news association, kind of a loose knit, unofficial thing to bring the best of the alternative media out, to bring the best of the alternative media together, to cooperate, to unify to a certain degree, but keep your autonomy at the same time, uh, to challenge the dominant narrative, which will supplement the acts of rebellion that this pastor in Edmonton um, exemplified. So these... These are the things that we're going to have to resort to. Uh, maybe we can learn from Gandhi's experiences and his civil disobedience and the writings of Thoreau, uh, Henry David Thoreau on civil disobedience. There's a lot of real gems of truth out there and some really good principles. And so we need to find those and enact them. And we need to do it assertively and quickly because the door is, is the castle door, you might say, is closing faster than a lot of us would like to admit. We have to act resolutely and promptly. So there you go. No worries. Thank you so much for that, Mark. That's a, an excellent summary. That uh, assertive resistance is most important. And the injection of thoughts into the community, into the community psyche, uh, that discussion, that elevator lift, that um, while you're sitting in a bus and you happen to strike up a conversation, all these things, because the, even those people in the background who may be listening, over-listening what you're discussing, are still an opportunity of consideration, of thoughtful deliberation. And of course, the the thing is that in regard to, if you like, the renewing of your mind, and that's what this is. This is about renewing of your mind. It's actually about going back into our culture, into these deep and very solid roots of our Christian traditions, of which of all our three nations inherited from their mother England. They inherited this in the common law or the canon law, if you like, limited constitutional government. Britain itself is suffering from... Um, if you like, bureaucratic lawlessness and the absolute power of parliament. And this is a problem, as we are all experiencing in the West, in the free world, the sons and daughters, if you like, of the Westminster system of parliament. Thank you so much today, Mark, special guest, and Robert. It's always a pleasure to have you on and a good, healthy discussion. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. No worries. Cheers, then.